start? Yeah. <laughs> this is a pretty good homecoming, isn't it? This is a great homecoming weekend. Hi, everyone. I'm Susan King. I'm the Dean of the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. And I am really excited to welcome you here. Um, and just a couple things to start with. Um, our JAFA board, which is the alumni board, which is such a terrific board for the school, has been saying for a while, we really want to make homecoming great. You know, we really. So first of all, we got the weather today. And those of you who are like me think you're supposed to have a raccoon coat at a football party, tomorrow's <laughs> perfect, but it's going to be really cold. Um, but uh, they've been wanting to have a, you know, the kind of barbecue, the trail, uh, the, what do you call it, the, what's the back of the truck now? When we do a football game, yeah. so, yeah. yes, <laughs> She's got a better word than tailgating for it, but we're going to talk about it. So we've got the tailgating event tomorrow over by you know, the Bell Tower, and that was the first. But then it was like the Jackal Board said, no, mm, not enough. You know, we want to come into the hall. We want to get in the school. We want to be here. So then, um, you know, we said, okay, let's see what we can do. And look at this room. Isn't this, this is terrific and full of energy. But first, I know we've got some folks from the Jackal Board here. Well, right, Robin? Is Robin said? Well, you stand up, come on. Where are we? Uh, yes. You came from farthest away. And it's now going to be from Caroline. Okay. You're going to see some of them later on. But that's how they really stimulated us to do it. So first, thank you to you. Then the second thank you has to be to one of our alums who's on our board of advisors, who, as we're talking about all this and what we might be able to do, um, comes up with this idea. Because she is a visiting professor here. She's coming down from New York. You know, most people kind of go to the Hamptons or something on the weekends in New York. Chapel Hill's pretty darn cool. It's part of this whole Southern thing, you know. And so Meryl Rose, Meryl, where are you? got to stand up. Meryl Rose is our visiting professor. Who, this is her third semester. And what we do in our PR and our strategic communication classes is we bring real world experiences to the students. So we bring nonprofit and for-profit companies that are trying to answer some issues, some problem, and they solve it. And so um, this summer, we came up, uh, we were having this wonderful discussion with Liza about her new magazine, which is called Walter. You're going to be learning more about that. And it was like, what could the students possibly take on? How do you launch a magazine, you know, in this era when everything's being disrupted? And so we took that on, and voila, let's get the hottest magazine in the country. That was a dream. And now it's here. Uh, not only for us, but for Rebecca, because it was a dream to do this kind of a magazine. So I know, you know, um, you're all wondering, how the heck did Garden and Gun get to be where it is from sort of nowhere? And it's got a very dramatic story. So we're going to start our conversation with Rebecca kind of giving us a little bit of a standing of what's happening today. And then she's going to join us in our own sort of the view kind of uh, conversation <laughs> with um, I'm going to say Dana McMahon, who is next to Rebecca. Dana is our professor of the practice. She is a guru in branding and design and entrepreneurship. I love her, and she describes herself as where design meets um, entrepreneurship. She runs our magazine class, and she has also had um, a relationship with the King of Flagler School, where our students started a nonprofit. And you can visit it on Franklin Street. It's called The Root. You can also go online and order for your Christmas presents. They're fantastic. I won't give any more commercials till later. And um, our other is our young student. Uh, not so young, she's a senior, and she's available in May for a job. So uh, I just want to make it clear, Liz is looking. And Liz Grandin, and you, you've got all their more bios here. But Liz is the editor of an online magazine called Synapse, which was started last year with she and another one of our students who is now at Bloomberg or Wall Street Journal? Wall Street, Wall Street Journal. Um, uh, so the editor went from working the Daily Tar Heel to starting a new long form on Kindle kind of magazine, and we're in our second year with Synapse. So she knows about launching that thing as well. So we'll have a conversation of all these different perspectives. But starting first, are we ready for the woman who was risky enough to call it Garden and Gun? Go back to Garden. <laughs> Thank you so much, Susan. Uh, I, I just gave Susan a copy of our book, The Southerner's Handbook, and so there you can read a little bit about tailgating in there. We'll teach you a few more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> anyway, it really is a pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, I've been traveling around a lot lately speaking, uh, and uh, it's nice to be back here at my home where I went to school. I, I was a graduate of the University of North Carolina. I'm not going to tell you when, but um, 
And, but not from the School of Journalism. I was actually a history major and, and planned to go to law school. So there was kind of a circuitous route of how I got into the magazine business. But I, I, I was thinking about it today. Early on, I was asked in an interview about the magazine where I had gone to school, and I said Chapel Hill. And the guy who wrote the article was very impressed with that. He thought that that indeed was the correct answer to that question, and that it showed that I truly was a Southerner and that I had not been totally destroyed by all those years that I ended up spending in New York. So um, it's, it's great to be here at Chapel Hill with you all. Um, I'd, I'd like to start sometime by reading a, a little piece out of the Southerner's Handbook, which is our book that came out about a year ago. And, uh, but thinking about all the great writers that we have uh, who write for the magazine and who have written in our book, Daniel Wallace, um, Randall Keenan, Wells Tower, I, I decided that that would be kind of risky to pick one of them. So instead, I just am going to start by reading this quote from uh, the front of the magazine that Clyde Edgerton wrote, so another great North Carolina-connected person. Um, and I'm so proud because Clyde uh, wrote in our very first, he wrote a piece in the very first issue of Gardening Gun, and he continues to be our book editor. And we were one of very few magazines that still has a regular book column. That's, that's definitely something of the, of the past, and I'm, I'm really proud that we've maintained that. And this is what he says, because I was born in the South, I'm a Southerner. If I had been born in the North, the West, or the Central Plains, I would be just a human being. <laughs> Thank you, Clyde. You know, I, I'm often asked what is, because the Garden Gun is a national magazine about a region, about the South, I'm often asked, well, what, how do you define the South? And I don't really know. I, I don't know. But when we launched the magazine, I know that I defined it by uh, where we could actually afford to get the magazine out. You know, we're based in Charleston, South Carolina. It was a matter of how far up this way and how far that way and how far down. And do we really consider Florida part of the South? I don't know. <laughs> so, but along the way, um, the Texans started beating the doors down. My husband, who's here at press, is from Texas. I always thought Texas was a separate country and wouldn't want to be part of it, included in anything that had to do with the South. But they wanted to get the magazine, and they wanted to be written about in the magazine. And then, so we added Texas, and it's actually one of our largest states of circulation at this point. Then Maryland started on us, and so we added Maryland. And the latest was Oklahoma. About two years ago, I can't remember if it was the governor or the lieutenant governor, but somebody started lobbying me that we needed to include Oklahoma as part of the South. So we, I went to my editor and I said, you know, every once in a while, if you can maybe do something about Oklahoma, that might be a good idea. So, um, but I knew from the beginning that the magazine was going to have really national appeal. And in fact, 45% of our circulation at this point is outside of the Southeast. Um, so we're taking over the world. We're over the world. Um, let me just step back though for a minute and tell you a little bit about myself and how this, this all happened. I, it's kind of boring sometimes to talk about yourself, but it is integral to how the magazine came to be. I grew up in South Carolina, came here to school, was on my way to law school, and, but wanted to go live in New York for a year. And so my father was a professor of economics at the you know, other Carolina, University of South Carolina, but he went to NC State and got his doctorate at Duke, so he's a, he's a North Carolina boy. But anyway, um, so I knew that the weight of his pocketbook as a, was through education, so I found a school called the Toby Coburn School for Fashion Careers in New York, and went up there for a year. I thought to play. It turned out to be a totally different experience. But what happened was that I had an internship at GQ Magazine in the spring, and I was offered a job when I graduated to stay and go on the staff of, of GQ. And um, I never, you know, I never left New York until about 10 years ago. So it was an amazing experience. I had the, the you know, an amazing career. I became publisher of The New Yorker, the first woman publisher of The New Yorker, and that was absolutely my father's proudest moment because I grew up in a household that we had subscribed to every magazine, we had every newspaper, you know, we were just media junkies. But I'm not, I'm also not a journalist nor an editor. I came up on the business side of magazines. And from the New Yorker, I went to a magazine called Mirabella's publisher that some of you may remember in this room. And then on to Fortune magazine, where um, what I'm most proud of that we did there was start the 50 Most Powerful Women in American Business uh, franchise. And so I loved my career. Everything was great. Loved living in New York. And then my husband, that crazy guy back there, decided, uh, he was a television producer, 
and decided that he had the call and was going to seminary. So we moved to Princeton, New Jersey 14 years ago, kind of chucked my career, and um, had, a, had a great time there, and he became a Presbyterian minister. So 10 years ago, we found ourselves moving to Charleston, South Carolina. I didn't go there to start a magazine. I really had no intentions of doing it. But I was on, walking on the beach one day with one of my best friends from, um, who lives in D.C. now, who actually went to Chapel Hill, and she was saying, you know, Rebecca, I think you ought to start a New Yorker of the South. And I said, are you kidding me? I, don't, I really don't think that people in the South are going to be very interested in a magazine like the New Yorker. But it stuck in my brain, and I thought about it and thought about it. And then, as luck would have it, um, I got hooked up with Pierre Madigo, who is the chairman of the board of the Evening Post publication, publishing company in in Charleston, South Carolina, that publishes our local newspaper. And actually, Larry Charlton is here, who was the publisher of the Post and Courier at that time. So he knows his story well. So um, anyway, we, we started talking about uh, the, the newspaper was doing a magazine called Low Country Living at the time. And Pierre asked me if I would come and kind of advise on that. And I did. And I, I just came to the realization that it was probably going to be a better way to go down the path of starting a whole new New, uh, magazine division within that company rather than to try to, to work with the newspaper staff on doing a newspaper, on a magazine, because I think the two are very different disciplines. So anyway, long story short, convinced the board, a very tough board of that company, to um, jump into the world of magazines and with this idea of this magazine called Garden and Gun. We'll come to the name in a minute. But I had realized that, that there were, was really a group of people in the South who I think are very sophisticated, very worldly people, who probably read a lot of other magazines. I mean, they're probably like some of you in this room who read Vanity Fair and Town and Country and all of these magazines, but felt like something was missing in those magazines, that they really weren't speaking in your language and weren't talking about things that were going on, I think, in a very important part of the country down here in the South. And so it made sense to me that there was, there was a void in the marketplace and there was a place for a magazine like this. So we launched in spring of 2007. We did four issues in 2007. We actually got funded on Labor Day of 2006. And to have a magazine out in the marketplace six or seven months later is pretty incredible that we did that. And then 2008, we, did, uh, we were going to do six issues of the magazine, but things were so good we did seven issues. And then, lo and behold, the bottom fell out of the economy, as you all know. And uh, the newspaper company decided that they could not continue to fund Garden and Gun. It was right at the end of 2008. And so I went to Pierre, who's now my partner in the business, and said, we can't let this happen. We've got to keep this thing going. There are just too many things that are going in the right direction and really good. And so we bought the magazine from the newspaper company and have somehow, by hook or by crook, kept it going through, through very, very difficult times. Um, during that time, I, I got a letter from one of our readers that uh, said, Dear heroes and heroines, if you ever close this magazine, I will come and shoot you down. <laughs> so, um, you know, that word God is in the title, so I, I knew what that meant, and uh, I, I made sure that we never let the magazine shut down. Since then, we have gone on to win the National Magazine Award for General Excellence, which is like best picture in our world. We have a very, very strong circulation story that I'm happy to talk about more later. But um, when magazines are really having a, t a lot of magazines having a very tough time, we are doing very, very well on the newsstand. We have this amazing audience that has come out of this, so that it's men and women and young and old but a very affluent, very knowledgeable, worldly audience that advertisers like to talk to. And so the result is, a, I always say, if it's pretty heavy, a pretty healthy magazine um, that I, I really am very proud of. And we've even been called the New Yorker of the South by the press, so I guess my friend was right. Um, I, you know, why, why are we doing well when, when I, you know, a lot of magazines, and particularly during the recession, magazines, big brands that I'm sure you knew and loved, like Gourmet and things like that, were, were falling apart. Um, I think we've, we talk in the language of our readers. We, we treat our readers with tremendous respect. And as a result, I think they trust us. 
We've been willing to take risks, and this is where I'm going to talk about the name a little bit. Uh, I think the gutsiest thing I ever did was to call the magazine Garden and Gun. It actually comes from, um, there was a club in Charleston in the late 70s and early 80s that I was never there, but I imagine was like our Studio 54. And so when I heard about this club, I thought, gosh, that would be just, I, you know, I could picture what this magazine could be. So to me, the garden is the, the land, which is really what everything in the magazine comes out of. And the gun is the, the sporting life, which is a, a big piece of the magazine. Um, I also thought that it said dual audience, it said male-female to me, and um, I often say, you know, I prefer going to a, a dinner party and having conversation with men and women, and um, I really think that that's, it, it makes for a very rich magazine, um, and it truly is. We hear stories about couples who fight over the magazine when it comes into their house, and, and the smart ones actually get two subscriptions to the magazine. <laughs> We've also remained, although we're growing, we've remained very nimble and we've been able to do things quickly. You may remember a few years ago we started the Garden and Gun Club ourselves, a, a membership group, and offered a, a membership in something called the Secret Society for $500 a year. Um, and believe it or not, thousands of people signed up to be a part of that. And that was a decision that we didn't do a lot of research on, just like I didn't research the name. I didn't want to be talked out of it. I just wanted to, to do it. And so we're, we're able to do that, too. Um, but I, at the end of the day, the mission for me has always been to do the best quality, the kind of quality that I learned in my career in New York, and be able to do it in Charleston, South Carolina, and have a life beyond. We were just talking about this earlier about you know not just going to work at seven o'clock every morning and leaving at ten o'clock at night, but having having a life. And if you hear people, if you don't know the magazine, but if you hear people talk about it, or I'm sure if you tell people about it, what people talk about is the the quality of the writing in the magazine, the quality of the photography, the beautiful paper. I mean, in, you know, when times were really tough, and I was looking. At, what can we do here? But I would never, ever sacrifice the quality of the magazine. And hand in hand with that is an incredible staff that we have that is really very talented. And as I said, we, do, we just treat our readers with, with real respect. Um, what's happened is that we've grown, and it was kind of part of my vision in the beginning, but I didn't know that it would necessarily happen. But we have really grown beyond the magazine, with the magazine at the core, we've grown into a real lifestyle brand. I think when you hear the words garden and gun or something is very garden and gun, there's an image of what people think that stands for. And it's, a, you know, it's really about this idea of place and soul, and it's woven into everything that we do from the incredible events that we do, um, our move into retail. We have a very strong retail program online called Garden and Gun Mercantile and Company, and we're actually getting ready to explore a bricks and mortar retail venture. Um, our digital, which I'm sure we'll talk about digital in a little bit. We have an amazing event uh, with, that we started last year that is the first week in December in Charlestown, at Charlestown Landing called Jubilee, which is the best manifestation of everything that the magazine is about. Um, we've just started a company called Garden and Gun Land, where we're working to pair conservation sellers with conservation buyers of recreational properties. And um, one of the th many, many other things that are still being hatched, but uh, next, next time I come, I'll tell you about those. But um, I really am proud of one of the things that we've done, which is our books. And um, when, when we, early on, we've always had a column called The Good Dog. And so I went to my editor-in-chief and I said, you know, I think that we could sell this concept of The Good Dog as a book. And so he went out, worked with an agent, and went and uh, gave pitches to the different publish book publishers. We actually got in a bidding war, and we ended up doing a three-book deal with HarperCollins. And they advised that we do the book, Good Dog as our second book, and that our first book that came out was this Southerner's Handbook, which, if you haven't seen it, please, I'm not trying to sell books, but I think you'll really enjoy it. It's just wonderful little essays about uh, different kind of Southern things. Um, it came out on the New York Times bestseller, bestseller last year, the week that we launched it. And then just last week, we came out with our second book, which is the Good Dog book. So everybody likes their dogs. I was telling Susan that, you know, every, this is always our bestseller every year. When we put a dog on the cover, it always it just sells incredibly well. So this is a, a great little book, and it actually is on the um, 
New York Times bestseller list this week. So um, it's, it's doing very well. And the last book that we'll be doing um, is going to be a cookbook. So that will be coming out about a year from now. Um, I just wanted to close with last week I was at, um, in Savannah at the Savannah College of Art and Design, SCAD, which um, some of you may know is really a wonderful school. And they partnered with us this year on our Made in the South Awards. And um, it was our fifth anniversary of doing those awards. They're actually in this uh, new issue of the magazine. And as I stood in that room and I looked around, because we had on the walls um, images of all the products that had won over the past five years, and many, many of the winners over the past five years were there. And I thought about how this magazine has done so much more than just be a great magazine. It really has changed a lot of people's lives. There's a guy named Chris Williams who was a banker, and he was making knives on the side. And he uh, was our first ever winner of the Made in the South Awards. And Chris was able to drop his day job, leave the bank that he hated, and start making knives full time. And so I think that the, you know, I guess I'm proudest of the impact that we've had on really bringing Southern culture to the forefront, elevating Southern culture, and I hope making Southerners uh, very proud of, of what, we, what we have here and all of the things that we get to do. Um, about three years ago, CBS Morning Show came down to do a, what turned out to be a six or seven minute segment, which is, as you know, all of you people in the business know, that's priceless to get something like that on the CBS Morning Show about Garden and Gun. And at the end of it, um, Gail King and Charlie Rose were sitting there chatting. And Gail said that you know, she thought that Garden and Gun was a magazine that was doing well by breaking all the rules. And I was flattered by that, um, but I thought about it a lot, and I don't really think that we're breaking that many rules. Yes, we've taken some chances along the way, but at the end of the day, Garden and Gun is just a good, old-fashioned magazine. It's well-written, it's beautiful, the photography is outstanding, and I think that that's the connection that we've made with readers. And um, at the end of the day, too, we've really stuck to being what we are about, which is about the South, and the land, and we we haven't wavered for that from that, and so here we are, seven or eight years into it. I've kind of lost count, but um, things are going very very well for the magazine, and uh, I hope they continue to do so. Um, but I feel like we you know we have taken this really well done, incredible magazine, and we are very carefully thinking about thing, ways that we can extend that brand beyond just what we do with the magazine. So I will stop there and we're going to say that. So I, I think that I'm just going to quote, uh, I did a video with Rebecca so that our students who may not be here today, we have some students, can place her interview in class. But don't you think that's a fantastic story to have them here um, in the magazine? We want to pursue a number of those ideas, but I'm just going to quote to her afterwards, because I did think it was a risky name, because, see, I grew up in New York. And, uh, you know, <laughs> with a name of God, uh, have that in there. And she said, it just proves. She knew it was interesting, and she didn't get a stick by your guts. <laughs> come on, not on. Um, but we're talking about brand extensions here, because as you heard, this is like a fabulous magazine, but it's also events, it's retail, it's digital, it's books, it's made the South Awards. So misbranding, Danny McMahon here. What does this mean? It's onto something. It's what, what, how do you describe this? And you're teaching this in your classes. Well, I have to say, you know, I grew up in the South as well. I grew up in Virginia, and um, I, I spent 10 years in New York doing, working in agency work and working on lifestyle brands. Um, I like to call myself the whiskey and mascara girl because I worked on <laughs> beauty brands and I, and I was always working on spirit brands at the same time too. And a lot of that sort of lifestyle um, elements are part of, of what I worked on in brand development. And when Garden and Gun came out, I have to say, I being from the South and being an art director, being on the creative side, I just I almost express it as an embarrassment of riches. It's so beautiful, and there's this sense of abundance and a portrait of our culture in this region that it lends itself to all of these kinds of brands extensions. Because I think what happens is that the magazine is is a is a vaulting point for the experience. And so you know when you talk about how really good products are much more about ideas, and ideas can come in all different kinds of forms. You can 
give rise to them in different you know, formats. And I think part of what you do is you have that solid foundation of the stories are there, the beauty is there, the incredible expression of a place and a portrait of terror is there. Right. And then you can take that and it's very easy to express it across a lot of different platforms. And one of the reasons we, we do this, you know, the magazine only comes out six times a year still. I had originally thought that we would be more frequent at this point. But um, I, I like the six-time frequency. I mean, I do get a lot of requests from readers, like, oh, give us more, we'd like to have more. But so that's part of the, the theory behind the, the brand extensions, too, is to have other ways to reach out to the readers and have touch points with the readers uh, to get into their more local environments. And um, But everything that we do, uh, you know, I mean, I, I must get, you know, thousands of calls a year from somebody like, we would like to be at your jubilee event this year. Well, that's lovely, but, you know, if we haven't written about it in the magazine, if it really hasn't gotten that kind of GQ, G, sorry, not GQ, Garden and Gun endorsement, it's, um, you know, it's, we're, we're not going to put the two together. Because the brand has to be authentic. You have to be clear or you, or you hurt it, right? right? Right, right, And you have to be very protective of your brand. I mean, you know, um, more and more, um, I'm, I'm hearing about businesses that are starting and using our name. And um, I have to tell you one quick one. Which there's a restaurant uh, group called, um, oh gosh, I can't think of the name of the company right now. But anyway, it's, it's being formed by former Hooters. Uh, <laughs> and they, their restaurants are called restaurants. And so they, were, they had filed for uh, using the name Gar Gun and Garden for their restaurant chain. And uh, we sent a little letter to them. And, uh, <laughs> trying to, you know, build this brand and a new magazine and reflect the community. What did you hear in Rebecca's story that's really resonating with you? Well, the storytelling really resonates. And, you know, we have tried to do, we, you, your magazine has inspired us from the very beginning. Our art director, Jess Morales, is here. And um, from the very beginning, so we tried to talk about our common language because I was a journalist and she had this visual sense. And how do we make it look like, how can we talk to each other about what we want to create? And you have to create know, you've just been inspired to us from the very beginning. Um, but what's interesting, I think, to hear what you're talking about from our perspective as a city magazine, is that when we started out, we were trying to tell stories that weren't yet being told about our place, mm -hmm. and to provide um, a, a really enthusiastic bright spotlight on all that's terrific about Raleigh. And in the process, we've kind of stumbled upon creating a brand. And, um, and didn't even intend to do that, but are delighted that that seems to be developing. And so I feel like we almost need to kind of go back to the beginning and think about it fresh in a fresh way. And Meryl Rose is helping us with that. And her students are very capable students. Are very really helping. Students. <laughs> um, and so, so it's, it's, it's really, really exciting to hear how you describe it, because I think we have so much. Um, I mean, we've got a city magazine, but we're, we're part of a really exciting growing region. And I think our potential to embrace that is huge. Um, and we've just started tiptoeing into events, doing a couple. And I know you do that beautifully and have done that beautifully for years, and we've got lots to learn. So, um, well, I would, I mean, I would say first of all, do not give up. Don't, you know, don't, don't give up. But I think, you know, when we were talking earlier about niche magazines, and I do think that, you know, that's kind of the hot spot right now in the magazine publishing world. But you know, you also you want to be broad enough that you can be meaningful to advertisers because you need that advertising money, right? You know, so so I would you know think about if you look at Garden and Gun, there are people who I know from the beginning picked up the magazine because of the sporting thing, the, the, you know, the, that was their connector. That was probably the first connector. Then there were people who oh, they've got really good writing, and so that group of people. You know, picked it up, who probably have nothing to do necessarily with the, the sporting life. And then it became the, the food people. Oh, look at all this food, you know, and then the music. And so I think that there, you know, as you sit and plan your issues and think about it, that there are ways to, you know, tap into these different different audiences and um, and therefore broaden, you know, broaden your reach a little bit. Now, when you say you weren't breaking a lot of rules, um, <laughs> We, we spoke to um, Samir Husni, who I think is back for you, and he, he took a look. This is the Mr. Magazine, who knows all, a guru of magazines in the United States. And he 
took a look at several Walters and said, well, who's your reader? Because this is confusing. You've got, you're, looks like you're talking to men, you're talking to women, you're talking about sports. Right. And, and you're doing that. Yeah. And the, the show was, was, well, I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> that was my answer. I'm sure he didn't like your, no, your title. No. I don't he is actually a man who, um, he is called Mr. Magazine, he's down at Ole Miss, and he uh, he tracks every single magazine that is started every year and tries to get the original copy or the dummy version of it. And there are over 700 magazines launched every year still to this day. Wow. And then, and you know, sadly, I you know don't have to tell you, only probably three or four of those 700 actually made it. But yeah, you can listen. He's very bright. He is, but... <laughs> Tell them I said, forget it. <laughs> so Liz, there you are. You, you know, had enough guts with your group last year to launch an online magazine. You know, breaking and trying to create a whole new tradition. You all came out of DTH. What are you hearing here? What are you getting? Confidence? Are you getting? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's what you had to say about quality. That there's so much pressure to cut corners in the news media right now, um, and that you shouldn't listen to them. You need to hold on to what readers want, which is good journalism. And I have a question for both of you, actually. Um, one of our problems with SNAPS is trying to find people outside of the J School to read us. Because right now with readership, we have this built-in audience of professors and students who love good journalism. Mm -hmm. So when you're expanding your readership, how do you bring the magazine to people that might not already subscribe or might not already have this automatic interest? How do you make them care? Well, I mean, one of the things that we did early on was to find other groups that you think might be interested in, in the magazine. And then, you know, I'm not a big believer in giving away your magazine too much, but I think that if you can introduce the magazine to the right people, get it into their hands, and then, you know, hopefully, well, it's, it's not hands in this case, but, get, you know, but um, introduce them, them to the magazine. And um, I'll tell you something else. And I can't, maybe I'll think of it after that. <laughs> But I, th but I think that um, good writing and beautiful design and if you, do you, is it illustrated? Do you have the top photographs? And mm -hmm. yeah, if that, that will do the trick for you. Yeah. I think you're right. As soon as people see it, they're, they're, the, it's amazing. I, and I know that you, you have your audience loves this about your magazine. Um, the writing is so good, and it's, um, it's you have the uh, the luxury of reading a really meaty story and kind of really learning something when you right. get to right. it. Right. And that's so rare in our. You know, yeah. digital world. So I think as soon as people who appreciate that have a chance to read, and we've been surprised would. that you know people that we never thought would be reading our stories like come up to you know people on staff and say, "I read this great story," and they're not in the J school. They might not be inclined to you know appreciate journalism, but it's good writing. People will buy into it. Well, I think one of the things that's interesting about your situation is you're doing an online magazine, so you take on the other element, which is user experience mm -hmm. in a digital space. Um, you know. You talked about user experience and the tactile nature of beautiful paper and gorgeous photography. And there's this sit on, the, on your lap and put a blanket on your you know, knee and just right. spend the afternoon with it, which is a very different user experience than doing the work online, that reading online, reading long form online. And how do you make that a graceful sort of space to spend time in when you're living, you know, staying with an article for a period of time? And how do you get through the information differently? in a digital space. Something that your readers will give you, I think, feedback on as well. I want to talk about money a second, though, because um, I want our students to walk out of here and make money, too. I want you to be successful financially. I want you to be successful financially, because I think that it says good things about our economy if that's happening. And lately, when people are talking about journalism, they usually not talk very about successful pieces. So you, you know, OA, who wants to start any business right away, let alone a magazine, right? So what are some of the basic things you need to do? You did risk. You did that. So you did risk. Your, your. Well, I, I, you know, the first thing I did was talk to my staff and say, um, you know, I want you to stick with me through this. Uh, we did have to take some pay cuts, and we had to, you know, cut some corners. I, I worked with our writers and our photographers and our printer and begged them to be gentle with us, that we would pay when we could possibly pay. But, you know, if you really believe in something um, and you want to go out and raise money, there is money to be had out there. I mean, even in the toughest times. And I talked to every person that I knew that had money, um, friends and, and people who weren't friends, lent me money. Um, and they became my very good friends. But <laughs> they money and I went out on a limb and, 
you know, swore that I would pay that pay that money back. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, what we do is, is fun, but um, it really should be, at the end of the day, hopefully everyone's getting rewarded for doing it. But I had to be realistic, too, that, um, you know, I had a nice career in New York and was making decent money, and all of a sudden I was, you know, sitting on the floor when we started this magazine, and then uh, for many, many years wasn't taking much of a salary at all and putting whatever I could back into the magazine. But, um, you know, the reward is there if you do, you know, you, you stick with it. But I also think you should be realistic about money. I think it's very hard sometimes when people start their own thing that they want to hold on to. 100% of that thing. And um, I just really feel that it's more important to, you know, own a piece of something that's the, that's successful than to own 100% of something that, you know, <coughs> you're wondering how you're going to make payroll the next week. So, um, you know, I think there are interesting ways to explore raising capital and to, to make things happen. But we also need to have diversified. I mean, you it's the grouping that you now it's going to make you really financially successful. Right. So at some point, it might be one of these other businesses that's right. feeding the magazine, right? And, you know, quite honestly, I'm, I'm not looking to sell the magazine at any point, but, you know, that there is a reality, and we've had, you know, we've had people come in and sniff around some of the big publishing companies. Um, so part of it, too, is thinking about and I never wanted to be, this sounds bad to say this in this room, but I, I did also never want to be just a media company. From the beginning, I did want to be a company that had other pieces of the business because I do think that, you know, you can, um, one of those, as you say, might be the thing that takes off and gets spun off or, um, or, or whatever. So, um, but I am, you know, I, I came up on the business side and uh, I, I almost wore my Carolina blue shoes today, but it was a little bit too cold to do that. But I, I have this really bad shoe habit, and so, as my husband knows, I, I have to make money to support it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but I do think that that is the bit. I remember someone from Hearst Publications um, saying at a small seminar I was at, our readers never left us. Our advertisers left us. The business world has shifted. Right. So that's part of why I think that it's interesting that you built the brand and that we're getting our students to think about right. the brand. Because it may not be one thing that does it. But, you know, it used to be people say, oh, they're just doing that story in the front page because they're trying to sell newspapers. Right. Well, now I'm like, that's a good thing. Right. They want to sell that's newspapers. You know, where are we going to get this information that keeps our democracy strong or gets our cultural and our soul? <laughs> Rich. Right. These are things that are important cultural institutions. That they, we've got to find, find a financial backing for them. Well, brands want to be part of the story, too. I mean, I think that's one of the things that Garden and Gun does so well, and I think it's one of the things that you see in other media alliances, that brands are trying more and more to, part of, to be part of the overall conversation, not just to tag along or something that's been stuck inside the pages to, you know, interrupt your day as you're trying to get to the recipe section and you have to get through all the crap food advertisements. Instead, Kraft Food wants to participate in the recipes. They're, they're the sense of content continuity between what's happening with brands and brands telling their own story and the availability of those audiences in magazines that have a real handle on how to make that story rich and engaging. There's a, there's a beautiful relationship there between brands that do it right and are authentic and transparent and have value in the marketplace. That same value is reflected in the content of the magazine and that's a that's a positive relationship. That's not someone sort of usurping what you're doing in the magazine side, but in fact participating. But that scares some people. Oh, yeah. Okay. But I, I, just a, a little bit more on that, I was going to um, say that I think that, you know, the best thing that a, a magazine can do with its advertisers is help them come along to figure out how to communicate the best way to that readership. And so instead of you know, helping them with their creative. Sure. Um, and you, you know this very well from, from the beauty business, but um, really saying, being honest with them and saying, you know what, and we, we do this. I mean, you know, we'll get an ad submitted from somebody and we look at them and say, this is just not going to resonate with our audience. Um, you know, I gave the example of Publix when Susan and I were talking earlier. Publix was one of those companies that said, uh, 
no way, we will never advertise in a magazine that has gun in the title. And uh, about a year later, they came into the magazine, and they're in every single issue of the magazine. <laughs> but they, we said, we will, and they don't do magazine advertising. So we worked with them, and they create a special ad for every issue of Garden and Gun that is about what the theme of that issue is. And they tie it very, so, you know, it makes sense. And uh, I, I think they want to be a part of our brand. Right. Well, I mean, I own a startup, and uh, you know, I'll be a 2015 Garden Gun advertiser. The startup I own is an organic distillery, the only one in the Deep South. And what you do in the South, what is first? What you do in the magazine completely aligns with what we do, yeah. you know, on the floor making our product every day, and that is it's a natural relationship between what our product users have and the kind of readership that you have. Right. And I think the same, we found the same thing with Walter in that, you know, the kind of events that Walter's doing and the focus on local and the richness of our region, I mean, you, you're really breaking that, you know, barrier that really has been isolated parts of the state. Now you're kind of telling a bigger story about what Raleigh, the capital, is all about. And that's a, that's a rich experience. And you guys, I think you nodded to it a little bit in the green room about you're finding even more of that here. You continue to... Yeah, I mean, we started out very, and, and continue to be very proudly of Raleigh Magazine, and um, <clears throat> continue to find that people want us to address the broader region. So we're figuring out how to do that well, maintaining our identity um, as, as a, you know, with the, with the triangle changing a lot. Um, but there, Raleigh had, for, in the minds of a lot of people, didn't have much of an identity for, for a while. Or it was a, you know, an academic town, or it was a government town, but it didn't have kind of this cool that Chapel Hill has. It didn't have, you know, the, so much history that's tangible in Durham. And um, and so I think we tapped into sort of a desire in Raleigh to be proud of where we were. And um, but at the same time, people like you were doing really neat things here. And there are people all over the Triangle who are entrepreneurial and creative and interesting and dynamic and. Yes, we need to figure out a way to make sure that we don't lose our identity, but that we address that larger, that larger story. So you're going to be the questioners next. So get your question ready. But Liz, I just want to say, when you hear about the advertisers and the branders thinking how they're going to move with content, mm -hmm. does that excite you, scare you, challenge you? How do you think about that? The problem that we face with being digital is a lot of advertisers haven't figured out how they can best show the case their work on digital format. Um, they're very much allegiant to print, and so it's hard to bring them in. Okay, we hear the other side of that. Yeah. Really? <laughs> I would tell you, because uh, I, I, I'm in a startup and I have no money, so um, I have to start with digital. Yeah. Because the print well, reviews. Team up. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you don't mind having them come into your space, your editorial space. How do you think that's um, a young journal? Are you referring to native ads? Yeah, that's yeah. one. That's the new word. They're yeah, coming word. from the reporter side of it, we're pretty uneasy about native ads, um, and that just might be a lack of a conversation between the two sides. Um, there's a lot of <laughs> ethics questions on how it would be presented and how it would fit in with the rest of the publication. Um, I think it's still pretty new. So there's not that many answers to that. Everyone's figuring it out, um, but it is exciting that there seems to be a new form of advertising that um, has a lot more potential and could be more lucrative than what's. Okay, who wants to be the first questioner here? <laughs> Stand up and tell us your name. And if you were if you were an alum of the school, we no, <laughs> well, you're welcome anyway. I'm astonished. Have you thought of the Garden and Gun channel on cable? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're well, already filming it. Right? Well, I mean, we actually had a conversation about the whole television thing today, um, and it's definitely something that we are, you know, we are thinking about. Uh, we do move into things, you know, we take we take our time and really think about doing it the right way. So I don't know if we'll be a channel yet, but um, but th I, I bet there'll be something in the, in the world of television soon. <laughs> um, the head of uh, Discovery International is an alum of the J School. You know, so if you need any connections, but you have Who else? I saw some hand up here. Move it. Yes, Meg. Oh, my name is Roxanne Kosh. I'm an alum of the PhD program here. I graduated last year. And so I teach journalism and media studies classes in Georgia. And one thing that we focus on a lot nowadays in academia is social media, yet you barely mention them at all. So how important are social media? Oh, absolutely. Strategy? And I didn't really, I didn't talk about digital either, but um, social media is a huge part of, of what we do. Um, I, it's particularly because our, our readership, I really don't call them readers, I call them fans. And they, they love to communicate with us, and uh, 
all forms of communication. But uh, no, it's a big piece of what we do. And we actually tap into um, social media to get ideas about what we're going to write about or if we're going to do you know, a story, let's say, on barbecue joints or something, we, we go out and, and ask, ask them to be involved and be a part of that. So it, it is, it's a big piece of what we do. How many tweet, tweet Twitter followers do you have? I don't know that. Okay. I'm sorry. I don't know that. 76,000. How many? 76,000. <laughs> and how many do you have? Oh, I have not that many. <laughs> on social media because it's very immediate. Immediacy is a very important element in social media. And so how do you deal with that difference in terms of immediacy? Well, I mean, we're, we're out there on a regular basis. We do um, we not just social media, but we do email newsletters on a regular basis. Um, so we're, we're communicating. What I'm trying to do is think of what that other magazine is that we could do with those other six months, those other six months of the year. <laughs> and I just want to say one thing about something that Rebecca did earlier that I didn't realize you were responsible for, but we just had an event up at Time Inc. Um, with Norm Perlstein, uh, um, hosted us for Alan Murray, who was one of the UNC grads, the new editor of Fortune. And um, Pearlstein is called no longer, he was, he's in a loose job, but yeah. no longer the debtor. He's chief content officer, so he's bringing this world of advertising together. But Alan Murray and the hosted our professor, um, Chris Rausch, who has a blog called Talking Biz. But Alan Murray went on about the biggest thing they have is this, the women, the oh, most the, important. The 50 most powerful women in the most, business. And they pay how much to come to this conference? It's thousands of dollars, yeah. yeah. And they beg to come to this conference because I can't go. I am not one of them. And so it is a really nice club, you know, and it is a huge franchise. And they've started an online, which is why I'm going, a thing called the broadsheet. And it is the, as no one's complaining about it, says Alan, yeah. and it is the fastest growing piece they have you know, at Fortune. So, uh, well, for all the women in the audience, I'll just say this. When I was recruited to go to Fortune, they were very interested in starting a women's business publication. And I recommended to them that I thought that that was a bad idea, that it would be better for the magazine, the big magazine to do treat women with more respect and have, have more stories on women in the magazine. And so um, that did happen, and then that grew out of that. But talk about money. And this has been a number of years ago now that that's happened. I can't believe you know, that I've been in Charleston 10 years. But um, the first one that we did, we sold over a million dollars of sponsorship to the conference. And the issue itself sold over ten million dollars of advertising. So um, I'm looking forward to when we're selling ten million dollars of issue. But that's why I think um, one of the things we are trying to have our students think about is the business impact. Yeah. Because it's not uh, there was once you didn't have to worry about that. Today you do. Yeah. And as a nod to your comment about social media, which is just really relevant and on point, um, it's really uh, social media is just about building community. It's just another way to have a community and a strong community management system in place that every business can take you in between content delivery. So if there's a book coming out or if there's a period in between, between the magazines, that play that we are always part of that community and how you are participating in the world, um, that's a huge role for any brand, regardless of what category that you're in. And that was something I was actually going to, that was my second point to you, was to really tap into, as you want to broaden your you know, your audience, social media is yeah. a great way to That's do everything for us. That's what we rely on. That's our tool. In the back of the room, they have blog. Yes. Uh, my name is Sharon O'Donnell, and I am an alum of ni uh, 1980-something. <laughs> I don't remember how to walk and get here. So I think we were Howell, though. You were at Howell. We moved into this building under Richard Cole yes. in 1999. <laughs> um, but I was wondering, I know that you have a roster of fabulous writers, uh, Claude Edgerton, uh, people that contribute. Where do you see the role of personal columnists in terms of the future of magazines, as opposed to contributors and article? Right. right. Well, I mean, I think that they, you mean a regular column? In right. The, right. 
I mean, we, we have them in Gardening, John Roy Blunt writes his um, piece at the end of the magazine. Um, Julia Reed, I mean, I think if, you know, Julia Reed were in every issue of the magazine, people wouldn't be able to get their fix of that. Um, so I, I think it's an important part, and I, I still believe that magazines, um, the, the format of having, we were talking about this earlier too, about having, you know, a build up to getting to the core of the magazine and then kind of cooling down, um, I think really works. And so, but you know, a lot of what I say is, is counter to what everybody else in the business is saying, but I still believe if you if you do it the right way and you give people something that they do want to spend time with and read that read that they will. So I I, I think it's an important part of the future. I'm gonna look someone in the audience gets one more question. Right? Yep, that's it. Hi, I'm Rachel Harden. I'm a 2007 graduate of the journalism school, and I um, work in corporate communications right up the road at a company called Quintiles. And while we aren't a fun publication like Garden and Gun, a big part of our job is protecting the company's reputation. And Garden and Gun has cultivated this, you know, this identity and this brand. And I'm just curious about what the process is when you get requests for advertisers or people in your award winning, you know, events to say that is or isn't in the Garden and Gun brand or identity. You know, how has that been shaped over time? First of all, let me tell you that while I was here in school, I worked in the Department of Biostatistics as a technical typer, and Dennis Gillings was my boss. No <laughs> wow. And Gary Cook. So, uh, Very cool. anyway, so tell him I said hello. I will. <laughs> um, anyway, you know, when I think about what my day to day job is, because as I said, I have very, very competent people who run our various parts of the company and do it extremely well. Um, I, my job is to protect the brand, and so I am often the person who, when something is brought to them, I'm the one who says no if it's the wrong thing, and um, I, I, I say no a lot, you know, and it's, it's hard to do, but we recently, because we are, you know, we're becoming a real company now, we have to kind of act like that, and so we, we had a, a two-day off-site where we went to Middleton Plantation outside of Charleston, and worked on our, our vision and our mission, but we also worked on a manifesto of what we what we are and what we, we aren't. And I did that because I wanted everyone to be on the same page as to why we were saying yes to certain things and why we were saying no. But we would never, as long as I'm there, we will never ever do anything where we just independently license our name and say, you can take this and run with it. We will always be very, very much involved in any any business that grows out of the garden and gun brand. So um, I've gotten pretty pretty good at saying no to people. <laughs> I don't say no in my own personal life ever, but uh... <laughs> Have you watched the way the New Yorker has handled its identity and all the ads and you know, the comic books and everything else? And, and is that has that played into your sense of how you want to own your identity perhaps differently than the New Yorker did? Yeah, I don't know what you're specifically. I mean, they're, they're on calendars and magazines and comic strips. I mean, they just seem to be everywhere. everywhere. And I don't think it has it's, much meaning anymore. Uh -huh. And I'm really yours does. It's lost its way. Yeah. Well, I think that's you know, it's it gets tougher as you're a more mature business and you're you're getting pressure to you know, what are you going to do for me this this year? You know, what are you going to do that was better than last year? Um, and I, I think that's a shame. I mean, I think the New Yorker. Um, also, even though it, David is doing an amazing job with The New Yorker, I think that it still struggles to appeal to a younger audience, and so I think a lot of those decisions are probably made as to, you know, how can we get this brand out here. I must say, we, we do, I'm excited about one thing that we're doing, and I'm meant to, to bring one, but um, we are actually following, and not copying The New Yorker, but we are doing a puzzle this year. So if you don't know what to give um, somebody for, for Christmas, we're, we're doing a, a puzzle and it will be sold through our store. But um, yeah, I, I think it's, I mean, it, it's it's hard as you, you know, as you're getting pushed by a big corporation, and that's why I don't want to be part of a big corporation again. Well, we want to have time for all of you to join us in the reception down in our gorgeous park library. If you were in Hal Hall, if you haven't seen the library, it's down the next stairs. You're going to go down the staircase. It's sort of right in the building. We're going to have reception there, wine, and, and some southern cooking. Uh, no, some southern. It's not. It's <laughs> <laughs> all I know, I'm here because I now.
now have a dog that looks like that. <laughs> and you were making ham biscuits all day long. Uh, <laughs> seeing that um, what attracted, I mean, I went to Charleston not knowing, for the first time, not knowing I would ever live in the South. And I had shrimp and grits and fell in love. And then went back to New York where they think you can eat anything anywhere and they do it better than anyone else. You know, I mean, New Yorkers are obnoxious, right? And man, they could not cook shrimp and grits or, you know, anything like that. And so I am now in Nirvana because I love it. But there is a sense of soul, and I'm an English major, so I get to the South with the storytelling. And what I'm hearing all of you tell, from branding to magazine to, it's about storytelling somehow and understanding that soul of a community. So I want to make sure you have personal time to talk to all of our, our fantastic Dana McMahon, um, our UNC alum who missed her chance to be at the school. But we'll <laughs> Liza is getting all the benefit of our current students, and Liz, who is going to be carrying it on um, in um, from May forward, and remember, she is open for a job. <laughs> and please go downstairs, park library. We look forward to being with you, and have a fantastic um, homecoming.